Okay, welcome everyone to this GPOS authors talk. Uh, I'm delighted to be welcoming Shauna Shapiro to talk to us here at Google today about mindful parenting. And I was thinking who better to talk to us about mindful parenting than Shauna, as she has 20 years experience as a mindfulness meditation practitioner, having studied both in Thailand and Nepal and here in the West. Um, she also has a scientific academic background with a PhD. She's a clinical psychologist and also professor at Santa Clara University. And maybe most importantly, she's a parent to her nine-year-old son, Jackson. Uh, I met Shauna first at, um, here at Google when she came. She attended our, one of our Search Inside Yourself classes. And the students reported how much value she added to the class just from her own experience and from her research. So I'm just delighted that she's able to spend a bit more time with us um, talking through some of her insights. Please join me in welcoming Shauna Shapiro. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. Yeah, well, I'm delighted to be here. Every time I come to Google, I feel really inspired by what's happening here and just kind of the, the vision and, um, and the integrity with which people are um, attempting to live these values. I don't think any of us are doing it perfectly yet and I'm sure there's a lot that's difficult, but really I feel the commitment here and it, it inspires me. So welcome. I'm, I'm curious, is everyone in the room a parent? Is anyone not a parent? Okay. And you're just here to, to learn about mindfulness? I will be. <laughs> okay, you will be. Well, that means you already are at some point. Yeah, somewhere in the consciousness. Um, so I, I'm really excited to share some of this with you. And what I was reflecting on, because there's so much that I would like to cover, and we have just an hour together. For me, what's most important is for you to understand what mindfulness is and to really give you an experience of it so that it can help nourish you as a human being and as a parent. And so towards the end, we'll get in specifically to mindful parenting. But um, my intention is really to help anchor us in what mindfulness actually is. And I want to take just a moment to acknowledge some of my teachers. Um, first of all, my co-author, Dr. Christopher White. He's a pediatrician. Jack Cornfield, Roger Walsh, Shinzen Young. And then this is a photo of my grandparents. This is Ben and Nancy Friedman. And welcome. I like to really acknowledge them because even though a lot of my training was in Thailand and Nepal and in Buddhist monasteries and my understanding of mindfulness does stem from that tradition, my Protestant grandparents um, taught me as much about mindfulness than any of my experiences. And they didn't meditate. Their passion, their presence, their curiosity, their kindness, their aliveness, that's the essence of mindfulness. This is a universal practice. It's a universal way of being. And it uh, transcends religion and culture. So again, um, my intention is really just for us to understand mindfulness first and foremost. Second, um, I want to briefly review the research and talk a bit about is mindfulness helpful? I think that helps motivate people when they know the science behind it. And then talk a little bit about how do we integrate it into parenting and ending with, with what I think is most important, which is self-compassion. I think if you learn nothing else today except to be a little bit gentler and a little kinder to yourself as a parent. In fact, how many people feel like they're not quite doing it right as a parent? I haven't quite figured it out. Yeah, yeah. OK, I'm, I'm right there with you. It's, it's actually this pervasive sense of I'm a terrible parent. Like everyone else kind of has it together and they're getting it, but I can't do it. And yet everyone feels that way. So I think this piece of self-compassion is really important. All right, so this is our book, um, this wonderful quote we have by Andrew Weil. He says, one of the most exceptional roadmaps on how to raise happy, resilient, and emotionally healthy children. And that's really the intention, is how do we raise children that are happy and healthy? That's what we most want for our children, not that they're rich and successful and famous, but happy, healthy, resilient, and then emotionally intelligent. Really not just using their intellect, but using their heart, their body, their sensation, their emotions for how to navigate life and, and live in the most beautiful way. 
So the foundation of mindful parenting is awareness and compassion of ourselves and others. Your own awareness, your own compassion, your own presence is essential. This is from Gordon Neufeld, who's been really influential in my understanding of parenting. He says, parenthood is above all a relationship, not a skill to be acquired. Attachment is not a behavior to be learned, but a connection to be sought. Okay, so we want someone to come in and say, well, just do A, B, and C, and it's all gonna be good, right? But actually, parenting requires connection and relationship, and this requires presence. Thich Nhat Hanh says, the most precious gift we can offer others is our presence. When mindfulness embraces those we love, they bloom like flowers, okay? So mindfulness is presence. That's, that's what it is. Mindfulness is about being fully here, fully present. And what that requires is that we begin to see things clearly. So the word mindfulness actually means to see clearly. To see clearly what's happening in this moment. To see clearly what your child is needing in a given moment. To see clearly, we need to do something. What do we need to do to be able to see clearly? We have to be able to pay attention. So I've been talking now for maybe four minutes. I'm curious, how many people have noticed that your mind has wandered off in these last four minutes? Come on, you're, come on, everyone. You don't, in fact, don't even raise your hand. I know. I'll, I'll bring you into my laboratory and I'll look at your brain if you tell me it didn't. Your mind has wandered in the last four minutes many, many times. What we found is that the mind wanders approximately 50% of the time. That's a lot. So let's say you live to be 100. That's 50 years of your life that are spaced out. And that's not even counting sleeping time, right? So part of mindfulness, part of the way that we learn how to see things clearly is by gathering our attention here in the present moment. So just try it with me for like the next two minutes. See if you can actually be here. Because all of your bodies are here right now, right? No one's left. Thank you. See if you can have your mind be where your body is instead of just leaving this empty shell that's kind of like spaced out and glazed over for me to look at, right? So good, you're doing great. A minute and a half left. You're all right here with me, I feel it. And you are definitely here, welcome. Okay, but mindfulness is not just about attention because otherwise a sniper could be the most mindful person in the world. They have amazing attentional skills. So mindfulness is also about why we're paying attention. What is my intention, right? What is my vision? What is my goal? What is the kind of motivation? So why are you paying attention? And then how you pay attention. So how is your attitude? This is the quality of your attention. You have 30 seconds left. Are you still here with me? It's kind of hard, huh, to pay attention, okay? So also looking at how am I paying attention? Am I judging myself because I just wandered off again? Or am I being curious and kind and saying, oh, whoops, there it goes. She said my mind was gonna wander 50% of the time. It is. Wow, interesting. So that's our attitude. And actually, mindfulness is about all three of these elements, intention, attention, and attitude. OK, does that make sense? So I want to talk about each of these. As I said, intention is really knowing why we're doing what we're doing. Why am I paying attention? What is my vision? What is my goal? Intention sets the compass of your heart. It says. I want to go in this direction. It's, it's not a, a destination. You're not trying to get anywhere. You're just kind of guiding yourself. This is the general direction I want to head. So you don't end up striving and getting really goal oriented and really fixated on where you're going. You're actually present for the process. And you're aligning yourself with what's most important. John Kabat-Zinn, who is one of my main teachers, he says, your intentions set the stage for what is possible. They remind you moment to moment of why you're practicing. He said, I used to think meditation was so powerful that as long as you did it at all, you would see growth and change. But time has taught me some kind of personal vision is necessary. I love that. First of all, I mean, he's so humble. He says, oh, I used to think you could just sit people down, have them meditate, and everything would work out. But now I realize some kind of intention. So when I work with my patients, we always begin with intention. Why are you here? My favorite quote by Suzuki Roshi, he says, the most important thing is to remember the most important thing. That's it. You just have to remember what is most important to you. And it's not so easy. We forget. 
This is a picture of my son. This is Jackson. He's nine years old, so he doesn't really look like that anymore. But I love this photo. And recently, I had this experience where um, he really reminded me of how easy it is to forget our intention, how easy it is to forget what's most important. So I was teaching in Europe, and I'd been gone for two weeks, which was the longest I'd ever been apart from him. And as I was flying home, I was just kind of filled with guilt. And like, how's it going to be when we reconnect? And have I ruined our attachment bond? And what kind of mother am I? And, and then I realized that guilt wasn't really going to help me reconnect with him. And so I set an intention. When I get home, the first day, all I'm going to do is be with Jackson. I'm not going to check my email. I'm not going to go through my mail. I just want to be with him. So I got home, it was a beautiful day in Marin, and I decided we'd go to the beach. So I'm packing up picnic and making it all perfect, so I'm gonna be the perfect mom and show him how much I love him. And I get all his stuff together, and I'm like, okay, Jackson, you wanna go to the beach? And he was like, nah, nah, I don't really wanna go. And I was like, come on, it's gonna be so fun, it's sunny and I have everything packed up, let's go. And he was like, okay, and he kinda like is shuffling out the door, and I'm 10 feet ahead of him, like already at the car, ready to have the best day ever so he knows how much I love him. And I get to the car and I look back and he's sitting on the ground on our front porch. And I'm like, Jackson. And I feel a little bit of impatience and that kind of familiar contraction in my body. And luckily I'd been teaching mindfulness every day for the past two weeks. So I had some awareness. And there was a moment where it was this choice point and I could see it. I could get impatient and say, hurry up, let's go to the beach, this is our plan. And then I remembered my intention, right? What was the most important thing? I just wanted him to know I was home and he was safe and I love him. And so I walked over to him and I sat down and he was actually looking at these ants on the ground, which were, were kind of interesting. And I sat down next to him and we're sitting there and all of a sudden he leaned his little body into mine and I could just feel his shoulder and his weight resting into me and the sun on our backs. That was the most important thing, right? And yet we forget. We forget in an instant. And so mindfulness is about remembering our intention. What is most important? Okay, so that's the first element, intention. So I'd like you to just let your eyes close for a moment and see if you can feel into why you're here. What's your intention? And don't really think about it. See if you can actually feel in your body, like maybe feel the love for your child. Just feeling into what is most important for you. And then you can let your eyes open and see if you can keep that alive in your body as we continue. Okay. The second element of mindfulness, as I mentioned, is attention. This is simply paying attention in the present moment. And as you've noticed, it's kind of challenging, right? So there's a picture of this adorable monkey up here because our mind has been compared to a monkey mind. That our mind swings from thought to thought like a monkey swings from limb to limb. Watch, watch your mind. Tell me if this isn't true. Can you imagine if I put like a big like, you know, loudspeaker hooked up to your brain and I could hear all your thoughts right now? Right? Can you imagine that? that? Our thoughts are, you're not in charge. You would not be thinking those thoughts right now. That, that's not where you would want your attention to be, right? Anne Lamott says, she goes, the mind has no shame. The mind has no shame. It's like walking in a dangerous neighborhood. You don't want to go there alone. You don't want to go there alone. The mind is just going wherever it wants to go. And so part of this practice is learning how to train the mind in the present moment, how to gather your attention back. And we do this in a very gentle, kind way. So it's almost as if the mind is like a puppy dog and it wanders off and you're like, stay, come back. And it wanders off again, you say, come back. We have between 12 and 50,000 thoughts every single day. 95% are the same. Think about that. Actually, don't think about it. Just experience that, right? So part of this practice is learning how to work with all these distracting thoughts and bring our attention back right here. 
and not get so lost in the thoughts. Emo Phillips, who's a wonderful comedian, he says, I used to think the brain was the most wonderful organ in my body, and then I realized who was telling me this. Right? So don't believe your thoughts. They're not necessarily real or true. So what we do with mindfulness is we begin to train and stabilize our attention in the present moment so that we can see clearly. Remember, that's what the word mindfulness means. We want to be able to see clearly what's true so that we can respond skillfully. And that's really the art of parenting, is responding skillfully. There's no way that I can tell you, we'll just do this when this happens. Because we don't really know what's going to happen. It's different. It's complex in every moment. And so the key to this is really being so present and so alive that you can see clearly what's needed and meet it in any given moment. Does that make sense? OK. The third element of mindfulness, this is the last one, is our attitude. This is how we're paying attention. When I first was learning about meditation, I went to Thailand. I was 19 years old. I didn't really know anything about meditation. And I met this beautiful monk. And he didn't speak any English, and I didn't speak any Thai. But he kind of motioned for me to pay attention to my breath going in and out of my nose. So I sat down at this monastery for a two-week silent retreat where you meditate from like 4 in the morning till 9 at night. And I paid attention to my breath going in and out of my nose. So what I noticed, just like you guys have been noticing, is that my mind wandered. So I'd feel like one breath, maybe two breaths, maybe even three breaths in a row, and then my mind would wander off. And so what did I do? Brought it back, right? And I brought it back again and again and again. And I started trying harder and harder. Like, why can't I do this? What's wrong with me? Has anyone tried to meditate before? Right? Anyone feel like they just can't do it, like meditation's not for you? That's how everyone feels when they start, OK? <laughs> and that's how I felt. I was like, oh, who do I think I am? That I could be a meditator, and I think I'm a spiritual person, and what am I doing here? And why, why am I at this horrible monastery? It's like 120 degrees, and there's mosquitoes everywhere. And you know, became really frustrated, really judgmental. And by the third day of sitting there in silence trying to watch my breath, not only was I judging myself, I was judging everyone around me. Why are all these monks sitting here? What are they doing? Well, they're just wasting their time. They're sitting here. What are they doing? There's, you know, and finally, a monk flew in from London who spoke English. And I had an interview with him, and I told him what was happening. And he looked at me with a lot of compassion and a little bit of humor. And he said, oh, dear, you're not practicing mindfulness. He said, you're practicing impatience and frustration and judgment. And then he said these five words that really impacted my life. He said, what we practice gets stronger. What we practice gets stronger. We know this now with neuroplasticity. Your repeated experiences shape your brain. If you're paying attention as you meditate in a judgmental way, in a self-critical way, in a striving way, in an impatient way, you're creating those neural pathways in your body. Mindfulness is about paying attention with acceptance, with openness, with a sense of curiosity, where you're actually interested in your own and other people's experience, with kindness, with trust, compassion. So these are offered more of like a heuristic, but it's this general sense of our attitude is very spacious, very welcoming, very kind. And as you practice relating to yourself in that way, that's how you start to grow these new pathways. Does that make sense? I want to clarify, though, mindfulness is not about being happy all the time, right? What these qualities are is they're, they're kind of like a pot. And mindfulness is this big pot that's always kind and always open and always curious. And you put whatever you're feeling inside that pot. So maybe you're feeling really frustrated at your child or scared about them, or confused, or lost. It doesn't mean you try to get rid of that and be kind. What it means is you hold that emotion, that fear, with kindness, and with curiosity, and with compassion, and say, what does it feel like to be scared? What does it feel like to not know what to do right now, and to really love this person? Okay. So these are the three elements of mindfulness, intention, attention, and attitude. 
This is the Japanese kanji of mindfulness, and the top character looks like a hat, means presence. The bottom character, shin, means heart-mind. They're interchangeable in Asian languages. So mindfulness could have been translated in the West as heartfulness. I don't think it would have caught on as much, but think about, in fact, feel how different it is to say heartfulness instead of mindfulness. That's what this practice is about. It's about this heartful presence. So what I'd like to do is practice for a very, very short period so that you can actually try intentionally paying attention in this kind, open, heartful way. Okay? So go ahead and sit comfortably. I'm going to invite you to put your cell phones and computers on a different chair and make sure they're off, please. They actually did a study and they found that even if your cell phone is out like that while you're having lunch with someone, both people rate the lunch as less satisfying and less intimate, even if no one looked at their cell phone. Just having it out and the fear that you might get interrupted made it less intimate. Now imagine how our children feel, right? Imagine how our children feel knowing that in any moment what they're saying to you is going to take less importance than whatever is coming in on your phone. Okay, not to guilt you, do not go into guilt. Guilt actually freezes the center of the brain that can make changes. Guilt is not helpful, we'll talk about that. So letting that go and just allow your eyes to close and just take a moment, we're just, right now remember, we're just learning how to pay attention. So begin to gather your attention. What you practice gets stronger, so right now we're training the skill of attention. So just gathering your attention and begin by just beginning to feel your body. So gather your attention into the toes of the feet. You can wiggle them a little bit. And then into the ankles and up both legs. Connecting with your seat and the chair. Feel your pelvic area and your hips. And if your attention wanders, no problem. Just bring it back. We're just, we're just gathering right now, training the mind in how to pay attention. So coming up through the spine, and then relaxing the shoulders. Pouring the awareness down both arms, into the hands. And then feeling the belly. See if you can soften the belly. And moving up through the rib cage into the chest and actually see if you can feel the beating of your heart in the chest. It might be helpful just to put your hand on your chest and actually feel the heart beating. And you can leave your hand there for a minute or put it back in your lap, but staying connected to this, knowing that the heart is taking care of you right now, and you don't have to think about it. You don't have to remember to make it happen. It just knows what to do. Sending oxygen and nutrients to every cell in your body right now. And then letting go of the heart and coming up through the throat. Feeling the back of the neck lengthen as you tilt the chin down just a millimeter. Bringing your attention up the back of the head and the sides of the head and the ears. And then into the face. 
as you just soften the mouth, soften your jaw, soften your eyes, soften the forehead. Just letting your face rest. And then getting a sense of your whole body sitting here. Feeling the awareness flowing through the whole body. And see if you can lean your attention a little bit down and a little bit back. We tend to focus mostly like forward in the front of our body. So leaning it down and back so you're really centered. You have all your resources available to you in this moment. And then just notice that you're breathing. Feeling the breath as it naturally flows in and out of the body. And again, you don't have to control it. You don't have to think about it or do anything. The breath knows what to do, just like the heart. It's taking care of you all the time. See if you can be fully present for just one breath, really feeling it in your body, or even just half a breath, just this inhale, or just this exhale. And so the breath becomes our anchor in the present moment. It helps us stay here where we are. And yet we're also open. So if we hear sounds, we just notice hearing, notice the impact in our body, and then let them go. If thoughts come up and begin to carry us away, we notice thinking, and then we return to our breath. Emotions, body sensations, all of our experience is welcome. Not necessarily because we want it to be here, but because it already is. We accept what is here because it already is here. How do I meet it in the present moment? How do I see clearly what's actually happening? So maybe just noticing what it feels like to be alive right now. and relaxing the body 5% more. And at the same time, heightening your attention, really clarifying, focusing the mind. You can be relaxed and alert. Your body can be physiologically at ease and your mind can have laser-like attention. So for the last two minutes of this practice, really infusing your attention with the attitudes of mindfulness, with curiosity and kindness, openness and acceptance.
trusting that you're doing this right and that it's unfolding in the right way and at the right pace for you. And just resting. You don't have to do anything. So as you're ready, taking a deeper breath in and out. Beginning to bring some gentle movement into the wrists and ankles. You might want to just stretch your arms up above your head and let some light come back in through the eyes. Good. And what I invite you to notice is that even as the meditation ends, the mindfulness continues. It's not over. You're still paying attention, still present, still seeing clearly. So the meditation is just a practice to cultivate the mindfulness, to develop these neural pathways of presence so that we can bring them into all aspects of our lives, including parenting, okay? So bringing this mindfulness, this presence, I'd like you to get with one other person just for a minute and just share something you noticed as we did this exercise. Sharing from your direct experience. So not, oh, my mother-in-law really needs to learn this, but what did you notice? Oh, good, you're alive. <laughs> what did you notice as we did this practice? Okay, so just take a minute. So I'm curious, what did you guys notice? What did you notice as you practiced? Well, I've never been told or suggested to do that, uh, focus your attention sort of down and back as opposed to, mm -hmm. I guess, my natural feeling of leaning forward and right. uh, going. So he had never focused his attention down and back. He's always kind of leaning forward, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and that, that made it a little more grounded and easier to stay inside myself. So that's what Beautiful. I noticed. I find that a really helpful um, practice because all of us tend to be a little bit forward, right? And a little bit up in our heads. And to just kind of sink down and rest back. Great. What else? Yes? Um, it's a conscious effort to push distracting, distracting thoughts out of your head. It's a conscious effort to push distracting thoughts out of your head. And it's actually exhausting and not really possible. So the invitation with mindfulness is to notice the distracting thoughts and then let them go. We're not pushing them out of our head. They're like waves in the ocean. They're going to keep coming. And what we try to do is drop down beneath them and look up and we can see them on the surface, but we're not getting tossed about by them. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, mindfulness is not about being perfectly still and empty of thoughts all the time. It's, it's not really realistic. There are more spaces and there's periods like that, but there's also periods of intensity and it just depends on the moment, really. Yeah. What else? How many people notice that your mind wandered quite a bit? Right, all of us, all of us. And that's why we practice. It's, it's almost like we're building a muscle. Right? And I go to the gym and I lift weights, not so that my bicep you know, gets bigger, but so that I can come home and pick my son up. Right? So we're practicing mindfulness so that we have these stronger parts of our brain and our being to be present for ourselves and for our children. So I want to move on a little bit now to the science. And I'm noticing that we don't have a ton of time. And so I'm going to skip to just what I think is most interesting right now in the field which is the effects of meditation on the brain. So this is just some basic science research. It doesn't have to do with meditation. But if you imagine that my fist is your brain, okay, I got this from Dan Siegel, who is a wonderful colleague and mentor and friend. 
So basically we have the kind of reptilian brain stem that formed early on, a lot of our fight or flight mechanisms. And then we have the prefrontal cortex that formed around this part. And this is our higher order reasoning. This is our emotional intelligence. This is the part of the brain that um, is most impacted by mindfulness. And so what you find is that people who are feeling happy and alert and vibrant and joyful, when you look at their brain, they have higher ratios of left to right prefrontal cortical activity. So the part of their brain, the prefrontal cortex, um, they have greater activity in the left to right ratio when they're feeling happy, alert. When you're depressed, when you're anxious, um, you have greater activity in the right to left ratio. Okay? And even when you have extreme depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, you can see this pattern in a deeper way. So what they did is they brought in 175 subjects to be tested in the laboratory. And this is this wonderful Tibetan Lama who's all hooked up to these EEG monitors um, so that we could see what's happening inside his brain. And what they found is that this meditator, this long-term meditator, had the highest left to right ratio in his prefrontal cortex that they had seen. Right? And so they wondered, well, is this just a random artifact? Like, was he born happy and that's why he decided to go and meditate for tens of thousands of hours? Or did the tens of thousands of hours of practice, right, strengthen certain parts of his brain that had to do with happiness and compassion and joy? So they did a randomized control trial. They took 41 biotechnology employees. Anyone can do this. Just kidding, I shouldn't say that at Google. Um, <laughs> And they taught them meditation and compared them to a weightless control group. And what they found was that the four month follow up, there was significant increase in this left to right activation. Okay. So this is actually really exciting and really hopeful news because in psychology, what we've learned over the past four decades is that we all have a happiness set point. Just like someone with their weight, you know, they can fluctuate between 10 pounds or so, but you basically are, you kind of have the body you were born with. Well, when you're born, you have a certain temperament. And what they found is that you have a baseline level of happiness that doesn't really shift that much over your lifetime. And they based this on research that shows that if you win the lottery, you have this spike in your happiness, which we'd expect, and then within one year, you're back to your baseline. If you get in a terrible accident and become paralyzed. You have a huge drop in your happiness, and then one year later, you're back to baseline. Those are shocking results that have been repeated over and over. So this is great news if you're born happy, right? You're like a Bobo doll. It's like stuff happens, you pop down, you pop back up, and it's no problem, okay? For many of the people that I work with, they were not born happy. And then this is really, really depressing news. It's like, well, even if I win the lottery or I marry the perfect person or I get the house in Hawaii, within one year I'm going to be back to this level of, of depression. So what this research is showing us is that even though changing our external circumstances can't change our overall happiness level, changing our interior environment, our interior landscape can. This is very hopeful. Richie Davidson and Mathieu Ricard, he was uh, the principal investigator of the study, he says, happiness can be trained because the very structure of our brain can be modified. So what he's talking about here is neuroplasticity. As I mentioned earlier, our repeated experiences shape our brain. What you practice gets stronger. What you're practicing right now, if you're spacing out, that pathway is getting stronger. If you're interested and curious, that pathway is getting stronger. And I'll never know. I mean, I kind of can tell from your eyes and your pupil dilation, but I'm not really looking. Um, so what, what I think becomes so hopeful and optimistic is the sense of like you have a choice. And every moment's important. Every moment as you're with your child is important. Not only for you, but for them, because our mere neurons, they're getting shaped. We're shaping our own brain and we're shaping their brains. And so there's no, there's no moments that don't count. There's no breaks. Not to put pressure on you, but there's no breaks. Every moment matters equally. In every moment, you're, you're creating a pathway. These are brains, um, these are brains from Harvard, actually, so that makes them kind of special. But they, um, 
they looked at many meditators' brains and they looked at the parts of the brains that got bigger and stronger through meditation practice. So when you look at taxi drivers, if you look at their brains, the visual spatial mapping parts get big and strong because that's what they're doing all day. When you look at meditators, what they find is the parts of the brain that have to do with attention, learning, emotional intelligence, self-awareness, they get bigger, they get stronger. It's called cortical thickening. And the more you practice, the, the bigger, the, the more cortical thickening there is. This is very hopeful news. We have the technology right, the meditation practice as technology to change our brain, to change the actual structure toward greater happiness, towards greater ease and compassion. So I like to think of this as like we have these super highways of habits, right, and they're really fast. You know what yours are, okay? And what mindfulness does is it says, is, is that really in alignment with your, with your highest values? Is that really getting you in the direction you want to be heading? And we have this opportunity to kind of dig out these little country roads of compassion or patience or presence. You know, and it's like, I could go this way, right, with my son. I could have been like, Jackson, come on, we're going to the beach. Impatience is one of my pathways. Or I could pause and just kind of go this other route, which maybe doesn't feel as familiar, but every time I start going down that route of patience or of kindness, I'm strengthening it. So the next time, right, there's not as many like brambles and bushes. It's a little cleared. Does that make sense? So the question really becomes, what do you want to practice? What is your intention? What is the most important thing to you? And so this brings us to mindful parenting and these are the five elements and these are kind of invitations of, of what to practice. And so our book really goes through these in, in a lot of detail and I'm just going to plant a seed and, and offer them to you. But, but these five pathways are, um, I'll go through each of them actually. The first one and most important one is unconditional love. Practicing that pathway, connecting, building the relationship, nothing matters if you don't have the relationship. And nothing is worth it if it costs you the relationship. If disciplining your child and getting them to do what you want in that moment costs the relationship, it's not worth it. So the, the foundation is unconditional love. This sense that there's nothing that will stop me from loving you whether you score the goal or whiff the penalty kick, get an A or an F, behave well or arrogantly, I will always love you and stay connected to you through thick and thin. That sense that you're not going anywhere. Okay? This is the foundation of mindful parenting. And this is where, this is the most important thing. Another important element that we practice is space. Allowing our children space to be themselves. We often micromanage as parents and we think we know best and we think they have to go on this pathway and I know for me I'm a professor and everyone in my family is professors and the the intellectual mind is very highly valued whereas the emotional intelligence and the heart not so much and when I chose to have my son go to a Waldorf school I remember family members saying well are they I mean is he ever gonna like learn how to read or you know like what and and so I was like, nah, no problem, no problem. And then here my son is eight years old, does not know how to read. And there was this moment in me where I was like, maybe I shouldn't have given him this much space and trusted. And yeah, he's you know, speaking Mandarin and Arabic and playing guitar and doing all this stuff, but he doesn't know how to read. Um, and I remember going and speaking with the headmaster of the school and she was just like, trust the process, trust this innate organic capacity that our children have give him space, and there's lots of encouragement and guidelines. And now he's nine, he's reading perfectly, it's no problem. You know, I don't know what would have happened if he hadn't learned now and I had to give this talk. <laughs> but there's something about giving our children space to become themselves and trusting that process. Healthy limits. This is the other side of space. Is it is so important for our children to have something to push up against, some limits. When parents are overly permissive, when parents don't set boundaries, it actually creates a lot of fear for our children. Physiologically, it creates fear. It's like, well, who's in charge? Who, who knows what's right and wrong? 
And I know for me, I'm a single mother, and I, you know, my ex-husband, he was kind of the disciplinarian, and I was like the sweet mommy loving one. And then when all of a sudden I was having to be both, I didn't do it very well, and I didn't create very much boundaries for my son. And after about two years, my son was ruling our house. Right? He was this little dictator. He was like six years old, and he was like, this is what we're doing. And I'm like, OK. Um, and that's when I decided to, to actually start doing the research for this book, because I was like, wait, discipline can't be all bad. There has to be some ways to create boundaries where I'm the mom, and he's the child, and he gets to be the child. It is so important to let our children be children. And so healthy limits is about really from a place of clarity and love and wisdom setting the limits. Not from a place of you're bad, you're wrong, I'm taking away my love. When we get to that point where we're setting limits, that's not healthy. We want to set the limits from a place of spaciousness and openness and I love you. That's when the limits create so much healing and allow our children to learn how to discipline themselves. Oh, this makes sense. I can trust mom, I can trust dad, they know what they're talking about, and they're doing this because they love me. Okay? So when we say no to a particular behavior, we do our best to simultaneously say yes to our child. And that's what's most important, is they don't feel like the no has anything to do with your love and your connection to them. Modeling and mentorship are another thing that we practice with mindful parenting. Who you are, who you are teaches your child more than anything. Who you are as you're driving along. Who you are as you're checking out at the grocery store. Are you making eye contact? Are you present? Are you on your phone? We're going to talk about self-compassion soon, don't worry, as I. <laughs> um, but our children, the way we learn is by watching others. We are, we're incredibly elegantly wired with our mirror neurons to actually like feel what other people are feeling and, and adapt in that way so that we become like them. So how we are in the world impacts our children more than anything we say to them. What we model. And then mentoring our children, actually spending time with them and offering them um, the skills and knowledge that they need. You know, when I, when I talk about my son not learning to read until he was nine, it wasn't that we weren't doing anything. I mean, there were, we had a lot of structures in place to support him, but there wasn't the anxiety and there wasn't the forcing behind it. So there can still be mentorship, right? And he and I, since he was born, I've read to him an hour every single night. And so even though he still is not a great reader, his vocabulary is amazing. <laughs> All right, the, the last thing I want to talk about is mistakes. And for me, this has been the most important thing, is to recognize that mistakes are natural, they're part of parenting, and they can in fact lead to greater intimacy and greater healing. This path of parenting is not about doing it right. It's not about being perfect. If there was a way to do that, I would tell you. <laughs> I would. Um, it's one of the most humbling experiences, continues to be the most humbling experience I've ever had in my life. Uh, and one of the most painful, one of the most um, requiring of compassion. So mistakes give us the opportunity to acknowledge our own limitations and then to demonstrate to our child how we repair, how we repair. The most important thing when we make a mistake is to acknowledge it and to say, I'm sorry. And to, and to really be in that vulnerability as a parent, which is, is challenging. So by modeling this for our children, we model the idea that you don't have to be perfect and that you're loved for who you are. There's this sense in our culture that I think is pretty pervasive that somehow I'm not doing it right. Somehow I'm not OK. I'm not quite doing this parenting thing right. I'm not quite doing this life thing right. Right? Like, I haven't figured it out. And, and what's wrong with me? Um, Tara Brock, who's a wonderful teacher, she calls it this trance of unworthiness, that somehow there's something wrong with me, or you know, other people figured something out that I, I haven't. And um, I think this causes a lot of harm. We want to model for our children, it's OK to not be perfect. It's not just okay, it's normal, it's natural, it's healthy. 
So this is from Jack Kornfield. He says, if you can sit quietly after difficult news, if in financial downturns you remain perfectly calm, if you see your neighbors travel to favorite places without a tinge of jealousy, if you can happily eat whatever is put on your plate, if you can love everyone around you unconditionally and be content wherever you are, you are probably a dog, <laughs> right? We hold ourselves to these levels of perfection. We think we should be feeling this way. I should be happy all the time and love my son all the time. I feel like being a mom is the greatest thing in the entire world all the time. So find me a mom like that. Find me a dad like that. And yet we're so afraid to acknowledge the humanness of parenting. And I think one of the most important dimensions of mindful parenting is this authenticity. Is our own tender hearts as parents, our own vulnerability, our own fears. The Dalai Lama, who has inspired me so deeply in my life, he, um, there's this story about him. It was from many, many years ago. I wasn't there at the time. But um, someone asked him, they said, Your Holiness, how do you deal with these judgmental thoughts? This kind of feeling like you're never quite doing it right and you're never quite good enough. Like you should be faster and more patient and more compassionate and more generous. Like what do you do with all that? And the Dalai Lama looked at him and, and he said, those thoughts are wrong. Imagine the Dalai Lama saying that. You know, it's even hard for me to imagine. Usually so like joyful and laughing and tee hee hee, that's such a funny question. But he said, that's wrong. He said, imagine that you're, a young child was reaching out to take a hot coal and burn his hand. He would say, no, don't do that. He said, these thoughts are like your mind reaching out and taking hold of a hot coal, and they're burning you. And they're not leading to anything wholesome or skillful. So you take your hand off those thoughts. With mindfulness, we practice self-compassion and kindness. And when those thoughts arise, which they will, we have many super highways of habit of that, that judgmental thought. We hold ourselves with compassion. We say, no, sweetheart, I'm not going to let you do that. And what's interesting is that a lot of times people say, well, don't I have to like, have those thoughts to like, keep my A game up or to you know, change and be a better parent or a better person or a better worker, colleague, wife? And actually, as I was saying earlier, the parts of the brain that actually can learn new behaviors, they shut down when you're self-conscious and you feel ashamed. So if you actually want to change your behavior, it comes through compassion and through inspiration. If you actually want to change your child's behavior, it's not through shaming them, oh my god, I can't believe you hit your sister again. You're the worst little boy I've ever met. That's not going to teach him a new way of being. That's going to shut him down. That's going to freeze him in fight or flight. So the way we parent is through compassion, through inspiration, through kindness. And it's we, in some ways, have to reparent ourselves. It doesn't work to shame and blame ourselves into being a good parent. I've tried it. It doesn't work. What works is seeing things clearly. Right? That's the definition of mindfulness. Seeing clearly so I know how to respond effectively. That's, that's the only tool we really have is our presence. Okay. So the word compassion in Tibetan always includes oneself. It's considered incomplete if it doesn't include oneself. Think about that for a moment. Right? So many times I hear parents who are so overextended and so exhausted and so burnt out and just, I can't, I can't do all this anymore. That's not really acting with compassion because you have to include yourself in the family system. So learning to take care of yourself, even if it requires a little less time with your children, is essential. And it's, it's hard, you know, we, we work with all these different things of guilt and how much time should I be here and how much time, and again, through mindfulness, you find your own right balance, what's most true for you. On my CD, there's a meditation called Metta Meditation or Loving Kindness. And it's a really nourishing way to practice kindness for yourself and cultivating that, that neural pathway, and then offering it to your children and to your spouse and to your family and, and out into the greater world. And I, 
I think combining mindfulness with compassion practices is really useful so that not only are we seeing clearly, but we're also cultivating the heart and the, and the mind. So I want to be respectful of your time and I just want to thank you all for your very kind attention. And maybe I will just stay up here for questions since we're at time. And if you want to ask specific questions, come and see me. My CD's right there, my book's over there. And thank you. Thank you.